Okay, well, we're just about a minute out. I'm going to remind us of some of the housekeeping items. I'm also going to uh, apologize for the lack of uh, voice here. Um, uh, but a but, uh, quick introduction to myself. I'm Lee Calco. I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'm also the founder of uh, Layer 5, which is a service mesh community. So certainly um, today's topic has uh, a vested interest for me. Um, as we get started, I do want to note that the Q&A box is, uh, should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to drop in your questions there as we go. Uh, I did toss out the challenge earlier that we've got uh, some seasoned uh, intellects uh, to present to you today. Uh, please don't leave them bored. Bring your questions. Um, this is an official web webinar of the CNCF, and so as such, you know, it is governed uh, by the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code. Um, you know, basically, you know, please be respectful of your fellow participants today, if you would. Um, so, uh, with that, I'll welcome some familiar faces, I think, out there in the crowd. So, is that Juan? It's been a couple of years, but good to, good to see you on the call today. Uh, I do want to introduce our distinguished speakers, um, some of which who do actually literally carry that title. So, with us um, today to represent um, an introduction to Network Service Mesh is Ed Warnickel. A distinguished Consulting Engineer at Cisco, Frederick Kautz, uh, Head of Edge Infrastructure at Doc.ai, and Nikolai Nikolev, uh, Open Source Networking Team Lead at VMware. Um, and with this, uh, I'd like to hand it off uh, to them to uh, teach us about Network Service Mesh today. Thank you. I think the first question we can't answer is who gets to speak first. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of that. So yeah. it often helps people to understand where you're going in the generic sense. And so we thought we'd do a little bit of an agenda here to start out. We've got a little bit of housekeeping up front of our own. Um, then we'll talk a bit about the, the vision for NSM. In other words, what, what problem are we trying to solve? What central insight have we had that differs from the way people have thought about that problem in the past? And therefore, what that allows us to do, in other words, what's different, what's new, what's innovative. Then we'll, well, <laughs> then we'll go on to the state of the NSM. We'll tell you sort of where we stand right now. We, we do have running code as it stands and a pretty vibrant community. We'll talk a little bit about some of the cool things that we're going to be uh, hopefully doing in the, new, in the not too distant future. And then we'll sort of do a deep dive into some of the more detailed aspects of network service mesh as there is time. So in terms of housekeeping, uh, for folks who've seen our talks before, we're a little bit QR code crazy. Um, so if you're watching this, you can haul out your phone and point to the QR codes that will get you to our website. Um, there's a QR code in the bottom corner of every slide that will take you to the slide deck directly. And then finally, we're extremely excited to be having NSMCon uh, co-located with Kubernetes on November 8th, with KubeCon at, on November 18th. Um, so if you follow that link, you can get to that page. We've got a really exciting lineup of speakers there that we just announced, um, and registration is open. So we would love to see you guys register for NSMCon and turn out to learn even more about what's going on. You want to start off with the vision? What do you guys? Sure. So um, NSM vision. So. Uh, we'd start off with some of the uh, the problems that we have, so should be able to hit uh, next slide. So um, part of uh, part of what we look at is we look at what uh, at a runtime domain. So think of like Kubernetes as being a as being a runtime domain where you run your your applications. Um, next. So one of the, uh, the second concept was you also have this concept of a connectivity domain. So connectivity domain, think of it like you use your CNI to connect to your to your connectivity domain. Uh, if you're in, uh, let's say you're in the OpenStack world, you use like Neutron to connect to your connect to your connectivity domain. Um, and so in Kubernetes, we're looking at an L3. So uh, you're looking at something that gives you an IP. You use that IP to to gain connectivity to to other things. 
Uh, you have some service discovery. So Kubernetes uses typically uses DNS and says, okay, well, where's the service at? Where's the TCP IP port for, for it as well? And you have uh, some isolation that occurs through policy uh, or service meshes, uh, application service meshes, if you decide to add them in. And uh, typically everything is within the same cluster or intra-cluster in terms of the connectivity domain itself with the option to have controlled ways to get in and out to the internet or uh, or the outside environment. Uh, next slide. So one of the problems that ends up happening is the um, is when you start to to try to drive intercluster workloads. I, I, so, think we, I think we skipped over a slide there somewhere. Yeah, I think so. There we go. Ah, okay, great. So when we started taking a look at uh, at east-west traffic, or what we, what we mean by that is like traffic between different uh, different clusters. So this becomes a very difficult, uh, very difficult problem. So uh, you, when you start to look at what's involved with that, uh, um, move move forward to the to the next slide again. So when you start to take a look at that, part of the problem is that you have all these various applications that need to talk to other applications. And uh, typically what ends up happening is each, uh, you end up having these perimeters and each of them have their own subnets. They have their own things that, that, that they, uh, bits of information they need to be shared in order to properly, in order to properly connect. And you have to work out how do you get policy across all of these different uh, uh, runtime and connectivity uh, environments. And so, uh, so typically, what the pattern that we're seeing is the runtime and connectivity in the environments are uh, one in the are one in the same. And, yeah, and and one of the things you tend to see there, and this is sort of where people are trying to solve the problem. So if you could go back one slide, um, one of the things that people try to do to solve this problem, if you could go back one slide, is they'll try and solve this problem by saying, okay, I will build a gateway that will connect my different clusters to each other at the level of clusterness. And, and the, the, the problem with this is that, generally speaking, you care about workloads talking to workloads, not clusters talking to clusters. It's extremely rare that everything in one cluster is supposed to be able to talk to everything in another cluster. Um, you know, we, we've solved this isolation problem within a specific cluster for the intra-cluster networking for Kubernetes, um, and it solves it well with the level of dynamicity with pods coming and going and, and so forth. But when you start trying to get things talking, workloads talking to workloads in other clusters, um, they're, they're not terribly great solutions for intra-cluster workload isolation for workloads that dynamically come and go very quickly. Yeah, and to make, make matters even worse, um, one, one thing um, with Kubernetes is Kubernetes keeps track of its service IP range, but it does not keep track of it, of the pod IP range. That's actually left as an exercise for the for the CNI plugin that you're that you're using. So when you're trying to work out what do I what can I share or what should I conflict with or not conflict with, and you start adding more and more clusters that need to communicate with each other, you end up with this combinatoric problem with a lot of information that needs to be uh, that needs to be aligned with each other. And in many scenarios, you're not going to be able to resolve the conflicts between them. So this, uh, this full mesh of connecting network to network ends up, um, ends up becoming very problematic and uh, is not an easy problem to solve without a lot of careful planning. And hopefully you don't have something in the future that doesn't cause you to have to redo all of this because of a, because of a compatibility issue of your new clusters as you add them in. And um, so uh, you, in, what ends up happening is uh, people who end up taking this approach end up doing a lot of hands-on work. It becomes a lot of, uh, of effort to try to keep, this, uh, to keep this on and it becomes very, very fragile, uh, especially when you start looking at the firewall rules uh, and, how to, and how to prevent these clusters from communicating things that they're not supposed to communicate between each other. Yeah, it, it, particularly when you look at public clouds where you may have different levels of isolation for those clusters and they may have different APIs for you, how you manage that isolation and different kinds of activities that you do to set up direct linkage between things. Um, it can get very, very messy extremely quickly. And uh, when you add in the service discovery, so when you start adding in things like DNS, then that just multiplies the problem as well. So like all of this just focusing on IP is, is complex. Throw in yeah. DNS on top of that and now you're, you're asking for a lot of pain. 
or, or even worse, the, the, the sort of, of VIPs that you get for deploy between different services deployed in different clusters, those ser Kubernetes services are only good within a specific cluster or exposed out to the broader uh, world. Um, if you want to say share services between these various clusters, that's, that's a difficult problem. And so this, so, this is one approach to the difficult problem. Go ahead, Frederick. Oh, yeah, you, you go on for, for this part or I can take it either one. Okay, I mean, so like people then have stepped forward and said, okay, well, we get all these problems. Um, we, you know, let's, let's do federation, right? So federation is the thing. And it turns out federation's a good solution for certain problems, but it's actually not a terribly good solution for this one. Um, it, it kind of hides rather than fixes the intercluster linkage problem that you have. So um, it, it, it also doesn't scale particularly well. So as you scale up to large clusters, you start running into all kinds of limitations in terms of propagating services, propagating um, your network policies, getting all the things that support them to scale up to handle them properly. And so as you add more clusters and you're trying to, at fine grain, pass this information between different clusters that may be geographically isolated, um, those combinatronics and complexity get much, much worse. Next slide. Um, and so in addition, the semantics of Kubernetes networking could in principle be federated across multiple clusters. But again, what you care about is your applications and the ability of your workloads to talk to each other. And so if you've got workloads that are running as pods, they're used to getting pod semantics. But if you have workloads running as VMs, and most people do, or you even have things running on bare metal servers on-prem, um, then those are used to connecting to connectivity domains that have entirely different semantics. So it's not even clear how you would extend this federated Kubernetes networking domain to them. So, and then you know, finally, when you look at, at sort of service mesh, there are lots of people who have basically taken the position service mesh is going to save us, you know, just deploy a bunch of Istio and a bunch of gateways. And, and like those tools are fabulous at layer seven, but they don't actually do anything for the L3 nature of this problem, the IP stuff. Right? So first of all, you wind up with the same full mesh combinatronics problem, but you also get the fact that you still have to peg up these L3 links because what everyone presumes out of the gate when they talk about service mesh is they presume when you're up at layer seven that there is some flat layer three living under you where you can reach everyone conveniently and you, you don't have various weird NAT games going on and so forth. Um, and that's just simply not true in a very large number of cases, particularly when you're doing multi-cloud and hybrid cloud situations. By the way, I do want to... Go ahead. Something that, uh, that also uh, um, adds to that problem as well. So you consider the, the cloud environments, like the number of times where I've needed a, a cluster to do something. So I just hop onto GKE or, uh, or AWS with EKS and just spin up another cluster to handle some set of workloads. And I uh, want them to connect into uh, to, some, uh, to some other service that's, uh, that's out there. Like if, if you're spinning up isolated environments, then it becomes easy. But if you want the system to, to interact with other, uh, with other Kubernetes clusters that are running long, long live services on your behalf, but you want to create that isolation, you know, and as part of your operational model, then like these type of problems uh, end up, uh, they end up occurring much more often because of how people tend to use uh, Kubernetes and, uh, and how they tend to spin things up in the cloud. Cool. So this, this gets us to sort of the, the central realization of network service mesh, right? So we, we, a lot of people have been looking at this problem. It's been very painful for a long time. And sort of the central realization for network service mesh came down to why are we welding our connectivity domain to our runtime domain? Why is it that every workload in a particular cluster only gets access to networking that makes sense within the context of that cluster? Um, you know, it, 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 it's a very strange presumption when you think about it, um, because where a thing runs and the kinds of things it needs to talk to are not necessarily intrinsically related. It's an accidental, a historical accident in the system that put us in this place. Next slide. And, and so when you really think about it, what you realize is what you really care about is workload to workload connectivity, independent of where those workloads are running. 
right? So if I have a collection of things that need to talk to each other, then they should be able to talk to each other with whatever kinds of stuff the network is supposed to do. If it's doing the based load balancing, if it's providing some policy based isolation, whatever, whatever those things are that it's supposed to do as it talks to its peer workloads, those should happen no matter where the workload is running. Not only if that workload is running in the same cluster, in the same you know, virtual machine zone, in the same data center, all of those are things that developers don't care about. They care about their workloads communicating. Next slide. So this is kind of where network service mesh comes in. So we, we, we rethought the problem entirely, right? So we said, okay, leave the intra-cluster networking alone, right? That works, let it be. So what network service mesh done is, does is completely orthogonal to CNI. We don't interfere with CNI. You don't have to run a special CNI plugin. We take great care as not to mess with the intra-cluster networking you're used to. So it's harmless to your existing Kubernetes networking. But what it does is it allows the workloads that you have running to connect to new connectivity domains. And those connectivity domains can provide whatever connectivity, security, and observability features you need to connect, you, you need for that connectivity domain. So we've got a, a couple of examples here. Um, so say for example, I've got pods that are running databases that do some kind of database replication. Say I decide that I want to have read replicas per cluster. And the replication protocol is not running over HTTP. It's some weird thing your database vendor put together. So you need L3 reachability. The, the connectivity domain you logically want is a database replication connectivity domain that gives you pure L3 connectivity between the database replicas, wherever they may be. And when new database replicas come up, you want them to also be plugged into that connectivity domain, even if it's the case that they're coming up in things that are not Kubernetes clusters, that are say legacy VM or, or bare metal environments. And another example here would be Istio connectivity domains. The Istio, Istio as a tool is brilliant at what it does at layer seven, but these layer seven service meshes tend to presume a flat L3 under them. So why not just give them one? You could run a single Istio instance over an L3 domain and have the different pods from different clusters connect into it and reach each other. And yeah. uh, to add to this, yeah. Please. Sorry, you go first, Nikolai. Okay, so uh, to add to this, uh, the beauty of it, and I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to get to how, how, how this whole thing operates today within Kubernetes, but the beauty of it is that essentially you can ask for these services at runtime. So you don't have to preset up your pods before, before they get uh, instantiated with all, all these connections, et cetera, et cetera. It's sometime in the middle of their lifetime, they can just say, oh, I need to replicate my database somewhere. I just need this connectivity. They can request it, get it, get their replica done, and then be done with it and continue doing whatever they want to do. So that's an additional yep. bonus. Yep. And then I think we've got one other cool thing about the solution in the next slide. <clears throat> if I'm able to get to it. So this is the other cool thing. Most of the reference work that we're doing in the network service mesh project right now is about building a reference implementation that runs with well with Kubernetes. But the underlying architecture that's been put together for a network service mesh is actually not Kubernetes specific. It's agnostic to runtime. And so as a result, you will be able to in the future um, have versions of that implementation that will allow VMs running in various VIMs to connect up to the same connectivity domain as pods, and likewise with on-prem services. So if you have some giant Oracle database running on a piece of hardware out in the middle of God knows where, and you would like it to be able to feed read replicas running in your clusters in various public clouds, that's exactly the kind of use case that we're aspiring to with things like our database replication domain. And as far as the workload running on the server knows, life is normal. It doesn't have to do anything weird or funky. And the same thing is true with the pods. From their point of view, you add a single light annotation and they automatically get connected to any additional connectivity domains that they need to be participating in. Yeah, and um, just to finish that concept up as well. So one thing you don't see in this scenario is you have like on-prem and you might have like, let's say your Kubernetes is, on, uh, is in, a, in a cloud environment. So one thing that you don't see in the CLO or this, um, uh, this peach colored line 
is the um, what it, what goes into building that uh, that connection. So you have to go through firewall, VPN, or other similar things to to reach to your to your cloud environment. So all of that is it still exists, but it gets abstracted into uh, into that connection. And so so an important part of NSM is to is from the point of view of the application uh, developer, you you ask for the thing that you want to connect to, like please give me access to the database, or please give me access to this SDO environment. But from the uh, from the point of view of the operator, the operator says, well, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. That means I have to go through this intrusion detection system, this firewall, and drive it all through through policy. So there's a lot, there's there's stuff that goes on here that you don't necessarily see, but uh, from an application developer perspective and so it ends up simplifying your 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 life in this scenario because you get to you get to abstract those away and they're, they're still there they're still important but they they're uh the, com the complexity is is controlled uh for you in, in this particular path by by your uh by your operator so what one other quick thing i i think we did comment at the beginning um, you know, I did think we, I, I sort of commented at the beginning that um, you guys should ask questions as you go. Um, we're perfectly comfortable asking questions. I know we had one attendee who raised their hands. If you could add any question you have to the Q&A box. Um, we also had a really interesting comment um, about think of NSM as an SDN controller. Mm -hmm. That's a super astute way to think about it, but with one really fascinating twist. Network service mesh is in the business of handling, handling virtual wires not virtual switches. So we sort of made a very fundamental error when we went virtual. We had these switches we were used to pricing by the port. And so we, we had these NICs that we were buying that were very expensive for our servers. And so we internalized the notion that wires were expensive, but once you've paid the per port cost, well, you've already got the switch, it does all the switching features. But it turns out in the virtual world, virtual switching is extremely expensive and complicated to manage and you don't want to make that the central element. But virtual wires are incredibly cheap. And so network service mesh, you can think of in some ways as a, an SDN controller for virtual wires. And we leave as an exercise to the people providing the network services, what kind of network services they're providing and how they're going to manage them. So there's a huge amount of flexibility. Thank you, Mohammed, yeah. for the chat. I, I often pitch it as a controller of controllers. So it'll it'll ask your controller saying, I have this context, can you please set something up that solves this particular this particular thing? So someone asks for a thing, I will give you a wire for it. Whatever it is you have to do, please do it. Exactly. Cool. Um, so we have a question who came in. How does a network service mesh work in a hybrid cloud model where the network appliances and the underlying connectivity domains are both in the cloud and on premise? So I, I think what it really comes down to is, again, if you think about these virtual wires, and I don't want to go too deeply because we've got some more stuff in depth later, um, but the way we've set up the mechanisms for handling stringing the virtual wires, and particularly stringing the virtual wires between on-prem and other public cloud domains, there are intermediate elements that we call proxy network service managers that can, when they get a request from, for any the virtual wire from this workload, they can tweak whatever knobs have to be tweaked for the particular environment you're in to allow you to get that virtual wire strung between the workload and environment A, or runtime environment A, and the workload and runtime environment B. And so that architecturally gives us the flexibility such that for any environment you're in that literally has the capacity to you know, connect to another environment, you can provide a proxy network service manager that will get you in and out, and I expect we'll see a proliferation of them as we go. Did, uh, hopefully that answered your question, uh, Sujit. Thank you. You want to grab this one, Nikolai? Yep. Um, yeah. So um, quickly, what does what is the status of uh, what is the state of NSM today? So back in April, I believe uh, NSM was accepted as a sandbox project within the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, we are, um, you know, uh, receiving the, all the, the, the needed support being such project. And uh, we are um, kind of uh, reviewing and aspiring to become a proper um, 
uh, what was the name? I forgot <laughs> the next level. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so uh, that's it. We are really proud of the proud of this, and really proud to participate to partner with uh, CNCF. Uh, one other initiative from uh, CNCF initiated initiative is the CNF testbed. Um, so this uh, probably brings up a little bit of the, the the topic of uh, is NSM positioned in the telco domain or is it positioned in the enterprise domain? And I think that that it it is, at least from my point of view, it is so fundamental of a concept that you can apply to either. And I think that the only only thing that can happen is that both can benefit from, you know, kind of mutually uh, evaluating, uh, kind of uh, uh, upgrading the project to, to the new to, to the new levels and new features and bug fixes and whatever. So uh, within the this the CNF uh, testbed, or so CNF is essentially cloud native networking functions. For those that are not familiar with this uh, uh, term, this is essentially the considered to be the next level of uh, uh, next networking function visualization concept developed like you know, six seven years ago, uh, which started with virtual machines. Uh, now a lot of telco operators and service providers are looking into this as a as the next. Uh, step into the evolution of the networking virtualization. The CNF testbed is essentially something that um, it has been announced last week um, at the uh, Open Networking Summit as an initiative that uh, is going to, 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 to become much more, um, um, we make a, a lot more sense within the, the telco world, the telco domain. We're proud to be there and to be part of there. Actually, there are a couple of use cases already uh, Enabled NSM, we're working with them closely and continue to do uh, to, to plot more and more use cases. Um, so we, we just had a question that came in on the, yeah. the chat um, from Mohammed asking, um, I'll be interested in the comparison between the NSM capabilities and the tungsten fabric as both are hosted under the Linux Foundation. Um, Might have I uh, catch that one since I've that's been like a good plan. Cool. Yeah, so one of the things that with NSM is uh, NSM itself doesn't actually provide the data plane itself, but rather we interact with, uh, with data planes. So, for example, the initial uh, reference architecture that we built uh, used uh, VPP, which is also part of the FIDO project, which is under the LFN. So uh, we are talking with people from uh, Tungsten Fabric to, to do the same thing with, uh, with them as well. So one option is to use them as a, as a potential data plane. The second thing as well is uh, Tungsten Fabric has a, a set of, uh, of uh, network functions that, uh, that we may be able to, uh, to connect people to or connect services or, or applications to. So, so part of the idea would be to how, to how to expose those network functions and help them become more cloud native um, in, their, in their design and NSM can help uh, connect things to it and help foster uh, some, uh, some good practices towards, uh, towards those goals. So there's, uh, so in short, it's, it's not really like a, an Apple to Apple's comparison. It's more, there, there's good synergy between both projects that, uh, that together can, can solve some, some interesting problems. Yeah. So I, one thing that might help clear up some of the confusion is network service mesh strings virtual wires between workloads and network services, connectivity domains, if you will. Um, but it doesn't actually provide the network services itself, right? That's something that, that you know, lots of people want lots of different things. Um, and someone just asked, can you elaborate more on the virtual wire concept? So if you think fundamentally what a wire is about, uh, a wire is literally something where if you shove packets in one side, they come out the other. And if you shove packets in the other side, they come out, you know, so basically if you shove in one side, it comes out the other. Um, and, and that's effectively what network service mesh does is, if you've got a workload, like a pod, we will drop an interface-like object into your pod and take care of all the niceties so that if you say, try and reach something that happens to be available from the network service that that interface goes to, your packets will go out that interface, it will travel over the virtual wire, and it will arrive at whatever is providing your, your network service. That might be another pod that's doing user space packet processing. It might be some VM running somewhere out in, the, in your, your world. It might even be physical network gear that's being managed by an SDN controller. Um, but all network service mesh does is it allows the workload to ask for 
and get routed to someone providing that network service. That it's request routed to someone providing the network service. And it allows the someone providing that network service to say, okay, here's how you connect a virtual wire to the network service I've prepared for that requester. And then NSM will see to it that we string up the virtual wire so that packets get where they need to go. Um, and, and so that's why I, you know, I think it's actually incredibly complementary to more sort of traditional SDN because we don't do something like try and configure all of your network switches for you so that they do some complicated routing switching behavior. Um, what we do is we allow a workload that needs to connect to that to have a standard, clear, simple way of asking for it that you can provide if you're an SDN controller. Uh, we had another question from Juan Ramon. Can you please describe how traffic policy can be implemented without going out of the L7 environment? Um, I'm not entirely clear on that question. Is anyone else? Or could Juan provide better, a little bit of additional clarity? I think that, that we, we can say that in general, this we, we from NSM point of view, this would be a networking function, which runs on top of NSM, and we just provide the functionality for it. So if you want to do any traffic policy, it will, it's something that, that is a matter of implementing it as a function. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I just want to add something to whatever uh, it was saying uh, in the, on the previous question. So probably one of my favorite things with NSM is uh, the fact that we don't care about the type of the payload. So if I were to invent my own type of payloads and I, I, I sh like that there's nothing, uh, uh, nothing uh, binding me uh, within NSM to any particular protocol or IP or Ethernet or whatever. If I want to invent my own protocol, I should be able to connect both workloads, both workloads sitting on both ends of the virtual wire, and they they should be able to talk uh, uh, the, their own protocol, uh, whatever. So this is, I think that is one of the fundamental things that NSM is introducing. So when we say a service or an endpoint that implements a service, we literally can tell that that this endpoint can expose whatever type of payload that it wants to, to, to serve. So imagine RDMA, for example, you can have an endpoint talking RDMA as a service. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, um, Cool, so, so getting back to things, and I know we're getting some very detailed questions. I'd encourage folks with more detailed questions if we, um, to also drop by the network service mesh, uh, Pound Network Service Mesh on the CNCF Slack. We're delighted to point you guys, we have lots of collateral on some of the details. Um, so getting back to the CI, this is actually something we're very proud of. Uh, yeah. Network service mesh, we run for every PR that comes in, we run our CI on AKS, EKS, GK, and vanilla Kubernetes running on packet. Um, and we, the reason we do that is we want to make sure that we ubiquitously run everywhere. And there are some tiny little nits between these environments. Then we just want to make sure that we're not getting stuck on any of them. And we currently run 449 tests across those four clusters um, mm -hmm. to ensure that everything is actually still working um, all the time. And some of these tests include uh, like uh, cross cluster uh, compatibility, like vanilla gates uh, versus AKS, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and we have uh, caught some some strange issues while uh, Kubernetes was upgrading on various clusters. So it's, uh, I mean, we put a lot of effort into bringing this infrastructure, and we are really pr proud of it. Okay. Multi-cloud resiliency, auto-healing. Ed, do you want to say something about auto-healing or should I take it? Yeah, let me go ahead and say a few things. So we, we, we've got this thing we call resiliency v1. And as you might imagine, it's because we've had smarter ideas since then we would like to do. Um, and effectively what this comes down to is if you could imagine stringing these virtual wires that connect your workload to some network service, you would like it to be the case that if anything involved in that process, including the thing providing the network service goes down, or restarts or any of the number of things that happen in the world, you want it to actually be true that you're, you're still getting the network service for your workload, uh, that you've got a blip in connectivity, not an outage. And so our auto healing is actually constructed that way. So just like in normal Kubernetes with normal L7 workloads, you know, if you were running an application service mesh up at layer seven and you know, some replica that's providing the, you know, some microservice somewhere that's a replica providing the service you want goes down, you just get routed to another one and you get what you're supposed to get. We do that kind of auto healing right now in network service mesh. So all the many elements can 
can go away one by one. So you could lose the local forwarder on your network service mesh forwarder on your node. You could lose you lose any of the network service managers in the process. You could even lose the thing that's providing your network service, and it becomes a blip, right? As soon as that piece comes back, we will reestablish your connectivity to your network service, and you're back in business. So you're looking at you know a few seconds of outage as opposed to a oh wait your workload is screwed, and that kind of resiliency is super important because things fail, right? We know they do. And uh, essentially, for one piece of your network service uh, gets I mean, disappears for some reason, we will try to find you another one if, if such a replica exists or something that provides a similar service and announces it, right? Good. Yep, exactly. Interdomain. This is, uh, yeah, the initial implementation of what we already said. We have things to improve there, but still, as we said, this is already part of our CI, so it's verified across uh, private and public uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, deployments. DNS. Right. Yeah, so DNS is interesting because obviously you need DNS, right? Um, but effectively, what it comes down to is that um, we need to make sure that you get what you expect from your Kubernetes DNS in your pod all the time. But it's also true that when you connect to a network service, it may also have DNS that it needs to provide you. So if you've got a database replica domain, you might want to be able to look up by name whoever the master is for your database replication in that domain. And so that, that ends up being a super interesting problem. But the good news is the DNS protocol is super well done for the most part for this kind of problem. And so we, we literally have a, a little DNS sidecar that will fan out and multiplex your DNS requests. So when you make a DNS request, um, we will send it to the Kubernetes DNS. If it, and we will also, in parallel, send it out to any DNS that's being provided by the network services or the connectivity domains you're connected to. And the basic rule is whoever gets across the finish line with a positive response first, that's what we forward on to your client. That's always in your Kubernetes cluster going to be your Kubernetes cluster if it's doing that. But if you're, say, getting DNS from a network service, that will also come in as well. And so effectively what it comes down to is if you want to do DNS style discovery over a connectivity domain, over a network service, we've got that code now. And so, security. security. So uh, in terms of security, like the, one of the things that people should be asking themselves is how do I know that a workload should be allowed to connect to a connectivity domain? Um, and so we're, we're collaborating quite closely with the Spiffy Spire guys. They've done a brilliant job of issuing um, authenticatable identities so that when your workload comes up and it says, I want to connect to your database replication domain, you can actually know who that workload is at a semantic level at, on, and know that authoritatively. And what that allows you to do is to be able to, at a very fine grain, say, instead of go and configure a bunch of um, firewall rules with IPs, uh, which given that pods come and go and IPs shift all the time, is a really hard problem, ver ver you know, verging on impossible. You could use Spiffy Inspire to issue identities to workloads such that when those workloads come up, you know semantically who they are and you can make policy decisions about whether they should be able to connect to that connectivity domain at a semantic level instead of trying to munge a bunch of IPs and ports around. So real quickly, we do have some questions. Uh, let's see, uh, one Ramon came back and said, I wanted to know if the fabric message there is opportunity to do specific traffic treatment at that level instead of having this in the traffic out to a VNF to verify network access control? Uh, maybe. So I think what you're asking, Juan, is could I use the identity of the workload to decide whether it can access a connectivity domain rather than having to have something try and look at its traffic to figure it out? And if that's what you're mm. asking, then absolutely you could do that. In fact, that's, that's part of the whole point about the Spiffy Spire stuff. And then we had a question from Scott that said, as an IBM employee, I suppose I have to say, oh, darn, it sounds like you don't test this stuff in IBM Cloud Kubernetes service. Um, so Scott, what I would say to you is, we would love to, if IBM wants to you know, donate some, some time for us to do so and have someone come and, and you know, come out and help us get it working, we're actually in favor of testing this any and everywhere we can. So if you have a Kubernetes environment that's not being covered yet, um, we would love to work with you. Drop by the Slack channel. We would love to get that going. Cool. And it seems like Juan Ramon has indicated that his question was answered. 
Um, cool. And there was a question about on the chat. Um, is it correct to imagine this is a double overlay or does it uh, complement existing CNI? So no, none of our traffic actually runs over CNI. Uh, we're completely orthogonal to CNI. Uh, we leave CNI alone. We do not mess with CNI. We take great care to make sure that CNI is unharmed in the course of all of this. Um, so we are not running over CNI. In fact, uh, the fact that we hook in with uh, VMs and on-prem, uh, like CNI actually becomes a limiting factor in that scenario. Oh. Um, and CNI also focuses primarily on L3, uh, L3 connectivity domains. So when you start to pull in L2 domains or more esoteric uh, systems like MPLS or so on, then CNI, uh, the interface, the actual interface itself is, uh, is uh, limited in that scenario. Cool. Um, yeah. And, and Awesome. Yes. I mean, we have another one here is uh, from Nomura, uh, Nora. Uh, what about case where K, K8 runs over VMs? Um, and, and what I would basically say there is, um, I cannot save you from any sins you might be committing uh, underneath the, the covers for your nodes. So if you're running over K8s and your K8s nodes are running in VMs and your whatever is connecting your VMs is doing all kinds of crazy end cap stuff, I don't even have visibility into that. Um, and so there, there's nothing we can do to save you from that. Um, now, if, if you wanted to, to do something that would punch past that, we do have mechanisms in the architecture for you to introduce, say, a network service manager that could signal it. So we also have something from Mohammed. Uh, what, when is the planning for the official release? Uh, we do have a 0 0.1 release that we put out a few months ago. Uh, it's definitely sort of a pre-alpha stage. We're hoping to get a 0 0.2 release out. Uh, before KubeCon and NSMCon in November. Um, and, you know, so that, that, that's sort of where we stand timeline-wise time, time line on this. So you guys have been fabulous with questions. You're great. Yeah, and any, uh, any help that people are willing to give as well to help us progress that, we would more than, uh, we would more than appreciate. And even if that, uh, that help could even be in regards to like the previous example with IBM uh, time, you know, like we'll find things through that integration that'll help us improve the overall stability. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, feel free to help us get there as well if, uh, if this is something that'll be useful for you. So um, future stuff, resiliency v2. So I mentioned resiliency v1 earlier where you could lose any one aspect of the system and bring it back. Uh, we've got a smart idea and I won't go into the details with resiliency v2 where we think we can get to a place where you could lose basically everything except the workload simultaneously, and we would still be able to restore your connectivity um, and just have it be a blip. Um, that's going to be super cool if we can get that to work the way we think we can, uh, because it's sort of like if you've heard of Chaos Monkey, where you break a few things here and there all the time, uh, you could potentially bring in Chaos Gorilla and just have it smash all the things, and when they restart, um, then your connectivity domains come back and your, your workloads continue to be able to talk. So we've also got some folks working on Istio on top of NSM. I mentioned this is an example of having an Istio domain run on top of a network service mesh, network service or connectivity domain. We do have people poking at that in the community to get that up and working. Next. Um, so I mentioned Spiffy Inspire earlier for being able to give you authenticatable identities. Um, this is all super cool. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, last, the next piece we're hoping to bring in is Open Policy Agent. Um, to allow you to um, bring in very flexible policy as to admission control into a network service. So when a workload connects, you can have fairly involved policy about whether it should be allowed to connect to that network service. Um, there's another one that we've had some people uh, mulling over, and this, this one's going to be cool when it comes together. Um, there's been some interest in packet capture observability. So having a network service, a connectivity domain, so when your pot workload is attached to it, you can bring a Wireshark instance in, in a pod with BNC or something like that and have it connect to a network service that would allow you to get packet capture from uh, various links to various workloads. So you, if you've ever actually really had to get down to the wire, you know, the, the truth is always there on the wire, but in many cloud environments, it's complicated to get down to the wire. Um, and particularly, we're hoping to be able to do that in the future. Um, as an observability feature, subject, of course, to policy about admission. You don't want anyone to be able to sniff on this stuff. Um, but that 
sort of work per workload granularity packet capture of the workloads coming into a connectivity domain, wherever those workloads may be, uh, we're hoping that proves to be a very powerful observability tool for people. And uh, just to not get co confused, this essentially should be able also within a single cluster. It's not necessarily kind of sitting in the middle of the clusters and uh, you're sniffing only there. You can do this within your workloads on, on the same cluster. Cool. Yep. And then uh, there's another concept that's running with the tools that people are talking about. So we mentioned that we take great care to be orthogonal CNI, but we occasionally get people who pop up who say, I actually do want to ask for a network service to be interposed between me and my actual intra-cluster intra -cluster networking. Now, you know, this is clearly not something that should happen by default, but if you're really explicitly asking for it, there are a lot of interesting things you could do with this. Um, and so we have people looking at what it would take to make this possible with network service mesh. Um, we don't currently have that, but a good example of this would be right now, most people insert an Envoy sidecar into the pod with the workload, which means that it life cycles with the workload for Istio. Um, but we've had people who've sort of mused that it might be nice to be able to insert that Envoy sidecar as a network service um, because then you can life cycle it independently from the workload. So if you have a long running workload and you discover there's an issue with your Envoy, you can upgrade your Envoy to something that doesn't have issues without having to disturb your long running workload. So this is something else that folks are sort of looking at in the community. Again, we have an SM con, con coming. Join us. <laughs> yep, so we definitely have that coming. And then I think we have a bit more if folks are interested um, about how the magic works. So, you know, quick show of hands on the call. How many folks are interested in how the magic works? <laughs> yeah, with, um, with all of the questions that are being asked, I would say for sure people are interested in the magic here. Um, <laughs> or, cool. Moreover, there's a, a couple of a couple of questions that maybe we'll all raise up just to um, mm -hmm. make sure that they're complete. But the, I think the you know the, the virtual wire concept and how it was being explained that NSM um, is the facilitator of the connector of different domains and of the right, um, you know, establishing signaling for the right connectivity. But mm -hmm. that Ed, as we were describing before, I think there's a little bit of, it would help if you re-articulated how it is that the actual connectivity happens. So we, can talk, bit, we can talk a little bit about that on these slides if that would help. Sounds good. Does, you had something you wanted to say, Frederick? Yeah, let, let me prefix that a little bit on uh, as well. So when you think of NSM, think of it as um, this, uh, there's two primary things that NSM tries to do. The first one is it tries to discover where your services are. So there's a discovery component. The second thing that it works on is negotiating the connection to that service. So that uh, the result of that negotiation is the uh, is the V wire that uh, that connects you to it. So uh, so think so think of it as uh, as a concept to to help us with uh, with understanding this particular space. Um, anyways, uh, let's jump right into this, and that way that Ed can describe in more in more detail what's going on, and it'll be more simple. Let's back up a little bit, and we're going to give you sort of the abbreviated version. One thing that you'll find is there are a lot of good YouTube videos out there where we talk about this in much greater depth. But if you sort of think about this, when you talk about any kind of a service mesh at any level. Most of the time when people talk about service meshes, they're talking about application service meshes, which live up at layer seven. But we're talking about a network service mesh. It does many of the same things you're used to in a service mesh, um, only it does them for payloads that are layer two or layer three payloads, IP packets, et cetera. And so <clears throat> you know, anytime you have a service mesh, you have some kind of a registry for your services. And we're no different. We have a network service registry. Um, <clears throat> we also have these things that run called network service managers that end up running per node. So next slide. <clears throat> cool. So if you think about this in a Kubernetes context, right? So if you've got a node, what we're calling a network service manager domain here, um, when a pod comes up and says, hey, I need this network service, and it indicates that with an annotation, um, the network service manager sends a message that's to the registry essentially saying, find me a network service uh, endpoint that provides that network service. It gets back a bunch of interesting information that tells it what network service endpoints will provide it. And also, you know, how, you know, what policies it should apply in terms of selecting from the candidates. 
it then turns around and asks its peer network service manager for the one that it's the network service endpoint it selects, hey, I really do want a, a virtual wire, if you will, um, to this network service endpoint. The network service manager there um, does its work th at that point. There's a bunch of negotiation of what the tunneling mechanisms are here. And you wind up with the network service manager asking this NSM forwarder to build the pieces of the tunnel and drop an interface into the client on one side of the network service endpoint on the other. Now, this particular interface-like thing, if you're a normal application, that's going to be a kernel interface. But if you're actually a sophisticated packet processing machine, you're going to get something better than a kernel interface. Or you, you should be asking for something like MIF or something of that nature, because kernel interfaces are very slow if you're a packet processing machine. Um, and you sort of get that virtual wire in place there. Again, this is a very abbreviated description of the process. If you go look on YouTube and, and or if you drop by the Slack channel, we can point you to specific videos there. There's, there's a lot of really good like 30, 40 minute long talks that walk through this in great detail. Um, so we've got a question from Pierre Louise. How do you ensure uh, symmetry with redundancy with these virtual wires when you connect pods to a centralized stateful service? Um, Ah, okay. So uh, effectively, this is an interesting question, uh, Pierre. You're, you're sort of asking something like, do we, do we connect up two virtual wires? Um, and the answer is not by default. Uh, by default, we will fall back to auto healing. But then your second question is about stateful services. Uh, what happens if you're connected to one instance of a stateful service and that goes away and we need to reconnect you to another one? And the answer is the problem of sharing state between different, um, different network service endpoints that are providing a network service is the responsibility of the person who writes that network service, those network service endpoints. We don't enforce any particular way that you do it on them. Um, so that's really up to them to handle in the way that makes sense for the network service they're providing. And there are a bazillion way network services people want to provide. So we really can't effectively pick one true winner there. Cool. So we've talked a little bit about this already, interdomain. Um, so we've got a bunch of examples of domains when we talk about these. And these are sort of network service registry domains. These are places where you might have network services. So you can imagine having two different public clouds. Each of them have different clusters. And you might treat each of those clusters as a network service domain, network service uh, registry domain. And you'd give them different names. And the, these intentionally look a lot like DNS because we're used to thinking in DNS. You could also imagine in an enterprise having network services or clients for network services running in a virtual manager that's running a bunch of VMs. You could imagine it running in a physical network that might have a bunch of DC things happening with physical servers. All of these are network service mesh domains. And so the question is, how do you connect them in network service mesh? Then again, this is going to be highly abbreviated. So I do apologize, but we have limited time. And so effectively what ends up happening is you, you get the clients coming up in the normal fashion, the network service manager goes and, and looks things up in the normal fashion, and it ends up making its request to what we call a proxy network service registrar within its cluster. Um, we've got a reference implementation of that that can fall back to DNS in order to find via service record, whoever the network registrar is for that domain. Please note this is not the only way you can do it. It's just the reference implementation we've did, done. That then proxies that request to the network service registry, registrar in the, the other domain, gets back its response. Um, the network service manager can then go and we're showing the simple version here. It can make its request to its peer and set up the connection. So I think we're running up against time, so we probably won't start diving into the next topic. Are there any final questions before we hit the wall on time? So we've got a question from Vojek Dek. Can one span a service across domains and have the endpoints be picked based on client proximity to the domain of origin. Um, that is in, indeed our intention. Um, the sort of topological selection, we're still working through some of the details on, but that is definitely on the, uh, our, our list of intentions. Well, this is great. Uh, we are at time, and we had no lack of people trying to take on the gauntlet that we'd laid down, which is to break one of the three of you with a question and I'm not I'm not sure that we've been successful but there are there's some unanswered questions happening already and so uh, there's already a request for a round two of today's topic so today was the intro to NSM sounds like we've got a, an encore request for 
I, I dare I say a deep dive into NSM. Maybe we would maybe we would stand for like a, a middle of the road NSM and then a deep dive. Yeah, uh, I mean, so we, much we didn't even get to be able to get to some of the, the, the you know, we didn't even touch on things like how we bring hardware NICs and SRIO VVFs if you care about that stuff in. Um, if you don't care about that, you'll never know. If you do care, you probably care a lot, and we do have a, a direction we're going for solving that problem as well. Sounds like folks will, should either join the Slack, watch some YouTube recordings, uh, attend NSMCon if they can. Any other ways that you guys recommend people engage? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple ways. And so the ones you described, uh, we have a very active Slack. Uh, that's uh, pound NSM in the CNCF Slack group. We have a mailing list that you can send messages to. Uh, it gets a little less activity than, uh, than some of the Slack. Uh, we, we are available to, uh, people can ask questions on Twitter. Uh, we also, every, every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, we also run the NSM community call. So that's a place if you want to get involved with NSM in a more, um, in a, in, a, in more detail and want to help us build or want to tell us what your use cases are, that's a fantastic place to to jump in and uh, and let us know. Um, and and if you if you want to know whether or not your what things that you're building will work with NSM or want to know how it works with NSM, feel free to to connect with us, and we'll we'll help uh, we'll help you work out what uh, what path you should take. And uh, if it's something new that you want to build using NSM, then we we have different approaches we can use to help with that, including a uh, specs board and um that where you can describe what problem you're trying to solve and we have people in the community who will look at those and will will help answer those questions so get a hold of us and we'll we'll help you with uh with any questions that you that you have oh and yes Very we have good. a youtube channel with all of our meetings as well which uh taylor posted thank, thank you for reminding us about that Very good. Awesome. Well, we are at time with um, Ed, Frederick, Nikolai. Thank you for a great presentation today. And uh, I do want to remind the attendees that the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all at a future CNCF webinar. And of course, NSMCon. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.